everybody, and welcome to the Rockefeller Institute of Government. My name is Patricia Strzok. I'm the Director for Policy and Research here at the Institute. And I would like to welcome you to the Institute and thank you for coming today uh, for our forum. Uh, I'd like to just mention a couple of things before we get started. And first is to thank the CBC for uh, doing this event with us. And also to thank the staff at the Rockefeller Institute of Government who put a lot of time and effort into making this possible. One other thing I'd like to note is that there are note cards and pencils on your seat, and those are for questions and answers. So if you have a question that comes up, please write it down neatly as possible on that note card. And we'll have somebody coming through during the forum, Michelle, who's uh, back there in the black jacket, collecting those note cards. We'll be going through those note cards and asking the questions. So as a question comes up, write it down on the note card pass it in. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Andrew Rain, who's the president of CBC, who will um, give you some opening remarks. And the applause for Patty, but also the applause for the staff and the applause for this nice place. It's good to get out of the city and have the nice train, nice train ride on this beautiful day that you arranged for us. So thanks, and thanks to the staff of the Rockefeller Institute, staff at CBC who supported. Um, this is, uh, first of all, I can't thank you enough for, for co-hosting this because this is a really important issue. CBC works um, to promote the prudent financial and service management in New York State and New York City. And sometimes we have to work on short-term issues and sometimes we really need to um, sow the seeds for long-run change. And this is really about that. There are people here who've been working on this issue for a long time, but we need more people involved. We want to come out of this room smarter more energized with some of the answers to some of the sticky problems uh, that need to be solved, and, and really encourage New York State to further uh, explore and then hopefully implement a VMT fee, in the first a pilot and then a fee in the future, so that we could really move forward to that f use, utilizing the technology that allows us to have fair funding for transportation and transit. And this is really the, the linchpin to that. So thank you all for coming today. Thanks. Uh, I, I turn it over, I guess, to Patrick, or maybe Patty's got a do the thing, but Patrick Arecki from the CBC staff, our senior research associate who's done great work on this to kick us off. And I thank the panelists for coming because we have great expertise in this room and we can really have a great discussion. Thanks a lot. Okay, um, good afternoon. My name is Patrick Orecki. I'm from the uh, CBC staff. Um, I'm going to walk through briefly um, the work that the CBC put together uh, in this report that was released this morning and its kind of predecessor report that was um, released last month about transportation revenues and the VMT fee. Um, I'd also like to thank um, our colleagues from, from the CBC, Jamison Dig and Miranda Van Salas, who did so much of the research um, on this product. Um, so we'll move through quickly here so we can get to all the, all the great experts that we have on our panel this morning. Um, I'm going to provide a little bit of background again on the condition of New York State's roads and bridges, kind of why um, a new revenue source is, is necessary in New York State. Um, and then we'll walk through what a VMT fee looks like, basically the, the mechanics of how it might work um, and some of the considerations and, and concerns with implementing um, this fee structure. So first, um, it's important to establish just the condition of New York State's roads and bridges and why a new source of revenue is, is kind of uh, potentially necessary. Um, first of all, New York State's uh, road and bridge quality, you can see here on the left, uh, the road mileage in New York State um, is rough or very rough at a rate that's nearly two times greater than the national average. Uh, and similarly, um, New York State has a greater share of structurally deficient bridges compared to the rest of the nation. Um, so there is a, a need to improve the state's uh, conditions of those crucial transportation assets. Um, and to, to help fund work on those assets, the state has a number of, uh, of fees to collect revenue that totals $3.6 billion annually. Um, that is split between work on roads and bridges and another portion that's dedicated to mass transit and a, a small amount that also goes to general operations of state agencies that do this work. Um, but really significantly, there's $1.6 billion generated from uh, motor fuel receipts in New York State. That's about 40% of the total revenue that's used for this purpose. Um, 
But really, importantly, being such a, a huge source of revenue for the state, um, not only has it not grown in nominal terms over the last 25 years, but when you adjust for inflation, um, the per mile revenue generated from motor fuel taxes has actually declined by a little over 50% over the last 25 years. So the state is yielding less and less revenue to do work on roads and bridges um, year over year. So what does that kind of create from a, a funding standpoint? Um, last year, uh, the state DOT <coughs> calculated that in order to uh, promote a, a state of good repair on its roadways, it would need to spend about $5.7 billion on maintenance projects. Um, it spent $3.6 billion, meaning that there's this accumulating deferred maintenance cost that is continuing to grow um, over the last several years. So that's an issue that, that needs to be uh, addressed, whether it's through cost or revenue um, changes. Um, and one option for new revenue is, a, as we call it in this paper, uh, a VMT fee or vehicle miles traveled fee. Um, some other names that you see for it is a road use charge, a distance-based fee, um, a mileage-based user fee. Um, but they're all kind of one and the same. Um, it is a vehicle-based charge for each mile driven. Um, and the reason that uh, New York and, and other states and regional consortiums are looking at the VMT fee is, first of all, that it's proving to be feasible. There are a lot of states that have implemented pilots around the country, um, really led by the state of Oregon, which in 2001, uh, a, a task force was enacted legislatively to begin studying the issue. Oregon has done multiple pilots and uh, continues to work on implementation of a program uh, for vehicles in its state, but it's also been done in many other states. Um, they are further planning pilots, um, including in Delaware, uh, kind of is the eastmost state that's working on this. Um, and there are, again, on both the east and west coast multi-state uh, consortiums that are also looking at interoperability of a potential VMT fee um, regionally. It's also fair in that it kind of most closely aligns road use with the revenue generated to maintain roads and bridges. Um, so the, the motor vehicle or the motor fuel fee it kind of serves as a, as a slight proxy um, for use of roads and bridges, but the VMT fee more closely aligns and frankly most closely aligns use of roads and bridges um, with the cost to maintain them. Um, and then finally, it's, it's something that's sustainable. Uh, again, as we saw a few slides ago, the real value of motor fuel uh, receipts are declining. Um, so this is something that as uh, vehicle miles traveled continues to grow, so will the revenue associated with it. Um, so what we did in, in this paper uh, is really laid out what a VMT fee might look like. So there are three kind of main uh, program design components. First of all, you have technology, that's the, the hardware and software to actually roll the program out. Um, rate setting, how you would set up the rates per mile. Uh, and then finally, administration, what's the division of duties for how a program like this would be implemented. Um, and for each of these, we can already draw on uh, other state pilots and design uh, decisions um, and also kind of think about what the ideal system would look like. Um, so up first is, is technology. Uh, most of the pilots that have rolled out so far and will roll out in the future use so-called onboard units. Um, this is a, a small device or it could be a smartphone app when you keep your phone in your car, um, but some physical item that is, is onboard in the vehicle that's tracking the mileage used. Um, there's a lot of different design decisions with that hardware for how it's going to transmit data. So it could be something that is actively um, able to, to ping data back to a central location um, where it's recording mileage driven by the vehicle. Or it could be something that is a, a, a structure kind of like EasyPass, where you go by a, uh, a port anywhere located and uh, the data is transmitted in that way. Um, they can be so-called thin or thick client devices. So a thin client device is something that doesn't have onboard um, kind of computational capacity. It's just something that's recording the data that'll eventually be transmitted to a central location that calculates the amount of miles driven and what the fee associated with those miles is. Or it can be something that right on board has the capacity to calculate where you've driven, what your charge is, and kind of directly um, figure out what the billing process is. Um, again, how 
the data is transmitted, whether it's through radio frequency, kind of like an easy pass system, cell signals if you're using your cell phone, or a GPS transmission, which kind of <laughs> offers the most uh, capacity uh, because you can track exactly where miles are and try to vary uh, rates on that basis. Um, you can also, uh, some technologies allow for additional features. So if you're going to have an onboard unit in your vehicle, while it's there, maybe you also want to have a car finder feature on your vehicle. So there are other kind of uh, related but indirectly related features that you can include um, with your technology. Second, a really important decision is about how the, the rates will be set. Um, so the rate policy can take into account the size and weight of your vehicle. That's kind of your ability to get as closely as you can to road use. Heavier, larger vehicles are obviously causing more wear and tear on roads and bridges and, and therefore should be assessed a, a greater fee. Uh, the location of the driving, not every mile is the same. If you're driving in the, the central business district in Manhattan, for example, or if you're out in a more rural area, um, there's a, a greater cost associated with, with those more congested in urban areas, and you can vary rates potentially on that basis, uh, and also the time of driving. Um, within that, you have to think about um, what rate setting has to be for your fiscal goals as well. So if you're trying to fill a multi-hundred million dollar gap in deferred maintenance, your rate setting policy needs to be set such that you can generate the revenue that you think that you need to kind of maintain that state of, of good, repa good repair, which is uh, the ultimate goal. Um, and then a decision can be made too about whether you want to share a portion um, of that revenue with local jurisdictions. Um, it could be based on the amount driven in those areas, but in New York State, there's 115,000 center mile miles of road. Almost 100,000 of those are uh, maintained and owned by local jurisdictions. So that's an important consideration as well. And then finally, kind of a, a program design component is in administration. Um, there's been a lot of different setups used in pilot programs, but what is the government going to do versus private partners? Um, is the government just going to kind of set the rates and let private partners develop and install the technology, even take care of the billing, warehouse the data? Um, there are a lot of decisions to be made uh, on, on those division of duties. And then finally here, um, there, common refrains that come up when you think about implementing this program, um, especially in terms of generating public support. There are very common critiques of such a design. Um, we'll just work through five of them here and, and what other states uh, have, have done to address these considerations. Um, so up first, you have preventing evasion. Uh, when you create a system like this that uh, in its fully formed state would hypothetically charge a mileage-based user fee on every vehicle in the state. That's a huge administrative lift. Um, it does create some areas for, for uh, fee evasion. So uh, the state would need to develop a system um, with measures to make sure that people are not avoiding the fee or actively evading the fee. Um, that would require implementation of uh, delinquency procedures and making sure that uh, billing is efficient. Um, Importantly, some of this infrastructure kind of already exists or could be woven into existing procedures related to motor vehicles right now. Um, every two years in New York State, you have to re-register your vehicle. Every year, you have to go for a vehicle inspection, and some of the aspects of preventing invasion can be kind of woven into those existing uh, practices. The second is to reduce collection costs. Again, a huge administrative lift. How do you set up a program that doesn't become so onerous that you're you know, administratively imposing a huge cost um, on not only the users, but on the state to implement the program? Um, no matter how this is uh, implemented, it's something that's going to be a bigger and costlier administrative lift than, than fuel taxes, which right now are about less than 1% of total revenue. In Oregon, again, the most kind of mature program, they've gotten those costs to about 5% um, as they've become more efficient and effective in implementing the program, but it's still a, a significant um, uh, administrative lift. The single largest concern when people do polls about what a VMT fee would look like from end users is about protecting privacy and data. So if you're going to implement a system that, that uh, might track exactly where a vehicle is driving, there's significant and very reasonable privacy concerns on that front. Um, so depending on how the program is administered, the, the government and private partners would need to be accountable and effective in maintaining privacy um, and data, there are some options for, you know, if you 
would like to opt out of having a sophisticated technology in your vehicle, um, having a more hands-off approach, such as uh, self-reporting of mileage or during the vehicle inspection, your inspector can look at what your mileage is versus what it was at last inspection. Um, but you do uh, lose the ability to tailor your rates to kind of capture what the, the uh, driving is uh, causing in terms of road wear. That's one time a year. Um, it's not a very uh, effective way to implement the, the best program. Um, kind of the second biggest consideration that end users think about is, is equity. So there's a huge difference in vehicle miles driven in urban versus rural areas. Um, so there's a, a, a reasonable concern when you hear about this program as a rural driver um, about being assessed the, uh, a fee um, for every mile that you drive. Um, again, in the ideal form, these rates would be tailored to be different for urban versus rural mileage. So ideally, you'd have a lower rate in rural areas. Um, those rates would, would align with the social costs associated um, with where you're dri driving. Um, importantly, too, a lot of the research on existing pilots has shown that rural drivers are not uh, inequitably disadvantaged by such a program, um, partially because they generally drive uh, larger vehicles that are less fuel efficient. Um, so by freezing or in some states uh, phasing out the motor fuel tax, um, rural drivers might actually start to benefit uh, from that construct. And then the fifth consideration is making sure that the system is uh, interoperable, um, both with, with other um, states. Uh, if, if other states are going to pursue such a system, uh, the Easy Pass implementation kind of offers an example of somewhere where states have effectively operated the same program across state lines. And again, there are uh, consortiums on both the West Coast um, and here on the East Coast that are, are looking at uh, this and, and many other uh, issues. Uh, and so finally, CBC in our report that we released this morning included five recommendations about what uh, the ideal uh, VMT fee might look like. The first is to pursue a phased in approach. Um, every state that's implemented a pilot program has done this in a way, kind of targeting volunteers first and then uh, expecting to, to phase the fee in over time. Um, again, maintaining flexibility to accommodate new technology. This is uh, something that people have been looking at for well over 20 years, um, but there's still new technology that can be more effective in the future. Third is to execute a very clear rate setting process so that drivers um, know what they would be uh, charged for. Um, and then fourth is to vary rates by location, vehicle type and time. Again, there's a very different uh, physical and social costs depending on where and when you're driving and what you're driving. Um, and the rates would ideally be tailored for those variables. And then finally, um, to use this as uh, in addition to existing sources. So again, there are a lot of other um, fees and taxes already in place. Um, we think that the ideal VMT fee structure would be in addition to those existing sources. Um, so that kind of a uh, concludes our kind of introduction of the paper. Um, I think we have a, a couple seconds if there's any clarifying questions about what I just presented about the paper. Um, but if not, then I think we can uh, bring, the, bring the panelists up and uh, get started with the, the experts here. All right, thank you. All right, so the panelists are each going to present for about five minutes and kind of give you an overview of their um, position and their thoughts. And um, we're gonna start today with Michael Warren, who's the principal consultant at WSP, who has 20 years of project management on road usage charges. So Mike, if you wanna get started. Sure. I said I was gonna sit, but <laughs> can't be Patrick. Um, so hi, good afternoon. Um, Thank you for the introduction. So I, I've been running these types of programs, helping states, primarily in the West, um, explore ways to transition from the traditional motor fuel tax funding model to a VMT or what we call RUC. Um, I'll get into that in just a minute. But uh, I've got a couple of slides. A lot of this is going to be uh, redundant to what Patrick's already presented, uh, which he presented, quite frankly, a little bit better than I'm going to. But so. What is a road usage charge 
we call it RUC. Uh, it's called VMT fee. Some people call it a mileage-based user fee. Uh, some people call it pennies per mile. Basically what it is is it, it, treats your, it turns your roads into a utility. So you pay for what you use. Um, if you drive more, you, know, you, you theoretically will pay more. Um, if I decide to leave the air conditioning on in my home all day, you know, keep it at 60 degrees like my wife likes it, I'm going to pay more. Um, if my kids download terabytes and terabytes of YouTube data on my cell plan, I'm going to pay more. Um, so it's, it ties it to use. Um, miles are reported, fees are paid. It does offer both technology and manual <coughs> options. Um, the OBU that Patrick discussed is actually there on the bottom right. Um, some people call it an MRD, mileage reporting device. Some people call it a dongle. Uh, we try to stay away from that term. But uh, it, it, it is what it is. It reports the miles traveled. Uh, it can either be thin or thick client application. It can use cell, cell service, radio frequency. Um, it does contain, it can contain GPS. It doesn't have to contain GPS. Um, in the West, and not to, not to detract from what Patrick said, but in the West, we're looking at this as a replacement to the fuel tax. So you, you, you are assessed a gross road usage charge based on the number of miles you travel times a per mile rate. The gas tax credit, or the gas taxes that you have previously paid based on those miles traveled are credited back and then the driver is assessed a net ruck. Um, it uses existing marketplace technology. I think probably the most, uh, the most mainstream version that people have seen is the progressive snapshot. You know, the, the, the one that Flo keeps pedaling on TV, which those are really annoying commercials. But uh, not as bad as the Sonic commercials, though. Those guys just really annoy me. But they're not doing, they're not doing uh, ruck yet. And like I said, it also, it's also called VMT, MBUF, um, pennies per mile. You know, it just really depends on where you are and, and quite frankly, uh, California, because let's face it, California wants to be different from everybody. They just call it road charge. They took the usage out altogether. So again, uh, this is a little bit redundant, but why? What it boils down to is there's a perfect storm brewing. VMT is increasing. Fuel economy is incre incre increasing. Uh, fuel economy is improving. So less gas is being bought at the pump. And most states, um, I shouldn't say most now, because I think uh, there's 37 states since 2013 have raised their gas tax, raised their state motor fuel tax, but the feds haven't done it since, since uh, 1993. Um, on the top right, you can just kind of see a cost comparison of what things cost in 1993 relative to today. Um, purchasing, what it boils down to is the purchasing power is, in, is declined, and there hasn't been progressive change in, in increasing the tax to keep up with the cost of inflation. Uh, some common misconceptions. Driver, pri driver privacy is sacrificed. Um, not necessarily, unless you have Mark Zuckerberg handle all your data. Um, there are multiple technology and non-technology choices. The dongle or the OBU is the most predominant. See, I said it, and I just make sure you're catching it. Um, like I said, some require GPS, some do not. You can use a smartphone app. Uh, you could use things like an easy pass transponder. Um, you could also even just do a simple odometer read, although it does present its own set of administrative challenges. Um, and one of the things that we've done for all of the states that we've deployed these pilots in is uh, the state never receives personally identifiable information. So no motorist information is received by the state whatsoever. Um, it is tied back to the VIN. Um, some states have even done away with the VIN and just used a unique ID. So the onus of, of maintaining that PI is actually held by the private sector account managers, as we call them, the ones that are collecting the data, reporting the miles, and then assessing the ruck back to uh, the motorist. Um, this is just another tax. Um, this, the way we're talking about it out west is this is really just changing the mechanism. It's turning it into a, a more sustainable and future-ready funding mechanism. Um, like I said, gas taxes in most states are credited back to the motorist. Um, most states that we're talking to are actually saying keep the motor fuel tax in place because of the recognition of revenue. You can, you can recognize the revenue from the MFT a lot quicker than you can traditionally from a RUC system. So keep the MFT in place, credit it back to the motorist. Um, 
you know, as part of a ruck assessment. And that way you can still keep your revenue stream intact and start phasing in this more sustainable approach. Um, penalizes the environmentally conscious EV owners. Well, yeah. Um, California, I live in Colorado, um, which, you know, EVs second to the Subaru is the most predominant vehicle in the state of Colorado. Um, the EV owners are up in arms about this. They hate it. You know, I'm being penalized to buy a fuel efficient vehicle, an environmentally conscious vehicle. So you're penalizing me for hurting the environment. Well, that's one way to look at it. What it boils down to though is your, your EV depreciates the roads just as much as my, my GMC 1500. And quite frankly, I can't fit in an EV, so I'm kind of forced into that. Um, what we, and, and then some states are coming back and saying, well, I pay a royalty. You know, uh, Colorado, for example, they have a $100 per year royalty, registration royalty for owning an EV. Well, the way the policies are set up in Colorado right now, only $20 of that 100 is going back into the Highway Trust Fund. So, and that doesn't necessarily equate to the number of miles that an EV would travel relative to the motor fuel tax. So it's still kind of an unbalanced system. Um, we talked a little, about, a, a little bit about rural urban. Um, the rural drivers are unfairly penalized because they drive longer distances. Well, not true. Um, we've done a study, this is out west, this is not New York, so <laughs> what we found out west is actually rural drivers, while they may drive longer distances, generally they chain their trips together. So, and, you know, that you may drive to the grocery store and to the dry cleaners and to the feed store and to the vet and to the doctor and chain all of these trips together as opposed to those of us that live in suburban areas or urban areas, you just make, you know, you make one trip for each. So we, uh, we surveyed and evaluated 10,000 motorists throughout the West um, from Washington State, Oregon, California, Nevada, Arizona. What we found was the rural drivers were actually driving fewer miles than the urban, driver, urban and suburban drivers. Um, also, to, to Patrick's point, generally speaking, um, there's not many EVs out in rural areas. Most drive the GMC 1500 that gets, you know, I think in my case it's like 18 miles per gallon right now. If you credit the gas tax back, you may actually incentivize these rural drivers to participate in a program like this, where what they're paying in the state motor fuel tax would, would exceed what they're paying in a ruck. If you credit that back, they could carry a net credit forward and actually make some money off of this. Um, expensive to deploy and administer, higher volumes will reduce that cost. Um, so here's the future. And, and Trish is going to talk about some of the activities that, uh, that the I-95 Quarter Coalition is doing. We're going to continue helping states uh, explore and evaluate the feasibility of RUC. Um, Washington, Oregon, California, Minnesota, um, just to name a few, Colorado. Uh, identify new states, you know, hopefully. And then uh, expand RUC to explore what we're calling local variable time of day RUC. So not congestion pricing because that's a completely different set of clients, a completely different set of policies and strategies. But if you vary it by location, time of day, um, well, location and time of day, keep the congestion component out of it. You can still at least determine where you should set your pricing. Um, we are looking at ways to integrate RUC with connected and automated vehicles, as well as uses based insurance and EV charging stations and ultimately smart cities. Uh, Oregon is actually looking at ways to get administrative costs down, so they are combining RUC, tolling, transit, parking, all of these transportation fee services under a single mobility marketplace. So basically your one-stop shop for all things transportation funding and payment related to help drive some of those administrative costs down. That's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have uh, Trish Hendren, who's the executive director of the I-95 Corridor Coalition, which is an um, organization of more than 100 transportation agencies, toll authorities, and public safety organizations. Trish. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to start out by actually thanking all of you for being here and thanking the New York Citizens Budget Commission for really pushing this 
conversation forward. So I think one theme that you've gotten from the comments so far is that we have a transportation funding challenge. So what I'm hoping all of you are gonna come away from today is an idea of a potential solution how we address that. And Patrick raised a lot of the key challenges. So what I wanna do is share with you some of our findings from doing demonstration pilots on the East Coast and how to overcome some of those challenges. So what the I-95 Quarter Coalition, what we've done, there's a program that the FAST Act created called, we love our acronyms in DC, SITSFA. See if I can get the acronym right. Hopefully I have it on my slide. Shoot, I don't. Okay, Systems Transportation, Surface Transportation Systems Funding Alternatives. Did I get it right, Mike? Yeah. Okay. Well done. Um, so that grant program is a five-year program that is really enabling states around the country to start doing demonstration pilots to see is a distance-based fee even possible? Will the public even accept this idea? So we have engaged in that, um, that grant program. So again, five-year grant program. We've applied for three grants and received all three. Um, we are going to continue going forward. So again, as New York is looking at an opportunity, this is a great chance to take advantage of this program. So what we want to do on the East Coast is focus on out-of-state miles. So Patrick brought this up in the study, or the, uh, the brief you guys put together mentioned this. On the East Coast, it's incredibly important. So I live in Maryland, I drive through other states on a daily basis. So how in the world are we gonna have a national mileage-based usage fee system that would reflect the complicated way that people and goods travel? So out-of-state travel is one of our key focus areas as well as tolling. So there's a lot of toll facilities on the East Coast, and there's a lot of experience understanding how do you deal with interoperability? How do you deal with massive transactions across states and authorities? So let's learn from what they've done and apply it to mileage-based usage fee. Trucking, I'm really glad that Kendra is here because I'm sure you guys realize trucks are not big cars. They use our roads differently. They are very heavily regulated. They have a different voice. We need to make sure their voice is front and center as we're evaluating this as a transition to the switching gears from a fuel tax to a distance-based fee. And finally, amenities. So I call this the sugar that will make the medicine go down. Hopefully, we're not quite sure. We all drive around in a computer. There's tons of information in that vehicle, but there's this firewall between us and the computer. So I went to go take my kids to school, get in the car, turn the ignition, battery was dead. I would have loved to have known that the day before or a couple of days before, and that would have prevented a very unpleasant morning. So part of this exploration is what information can we get from the car's computer to give to people? Check engine lights, battery, trip logs, gamification, carbon footprint. So what are some things that we can offer to our drivers as we switch on how we fund transportation? So we're exploring that in our work as well. All right, so what have we done? So far um, with our first grant, we did a small pilot on the East Coast where we had residents from 13 states on the East Coast participate. These were not your typical um, general public, I would say. This is folks like yourself. We recruited individuals, thought leaders, folks who understand transportation to get the conversation started on the East Coast. So for these 13 states that were engaged, 155 participants drove almost um, half a million miles. So what did we find? So five things I'll go through really quick. I said out-of-state miles is important. Now we have data to show it. So 20% of the miles driven in that three-month pilot were out-of-state. So we think we have a little bit of data now to show the importance of that um, paying attention to out-of-state miles. One thing we decided to do is ask the question, can this technology estimate tolls? The answer is yes. This kind of gets to Mike's point. Is there a way to create a platform for all costs associated with using our transportation system? So this might be that platform. On the evaluated amenities that I was so glowingly talking about, uh, people weren't that enthused about them. So we're gonna try again um, in our phase two work to see if we can better describe what these amenities are. But so far, people's reaction was, eh, not, not too exciting. So we'll have to see on that one. So these next two findings I thought were just incredibly important for this conversation. So the first one here, again, 155 folks knowledgeable about the field. 65% said they learned more about how transportation is funded. And a third said they were surprised how little they pay. So I put myself in that category. So a month of May, I drove 600 miles, three different states. I paid $4 in federal tax and $7 in state fuel tax. If someone told me I was paying $11 a month to use all the roads, bridges, sidewalks, have my packages delivered, get my girls to school, get, go to the doctor's office, 
I would not have believed that. So what do we do with this with the public? If we don't know, the public definitely doesn't know. So the other areas on privacy, which again has been brought up by um, New York CBC report, it is real, it is important, but we find if you get people interacting with the technology, get them to do these pilots, their concern drops. So I'm a data fiend, I love data. You never see this. Three months, 57% concern down to 30. That's the kind of statistical drop that people dream about. So we have something that we can use, the pilots, to really push this conversation forward. All right, so what are we gonna do? Uh, as I said, we applied for three grants. We're finished with our first. We're engaged right now on number two, um, where we're gonna be bringing in the general public's voice. And our main partners for this grant are Pennsylvania and Delaware. So our residents, our residents in those two states will be our primary participants. So we're also gonna further explore tolling and the urban rural issue that comes up. We're gonna hit that on full force in this next piece of work. On phase three, we're bringing in new partners, including Transurban, the toll, international toll concessionaire to look at variable pricing. We're also expanding to New Jersey and North Carolina, again, just to bring more states into the conversation. And I put a star with this education and outreach because people really don't get this. So the more attention, the more emphasis we have in education and explaining what we do, the value of transportation, the better the whole field is gonna be. All right, so here's my pitch to all of y'all. Hopefully this is intriguing. If it is, at the end of this presentation, you'll see the website. Sign up. <clears throat> if you are live on the East Coast, I welcome you to participate in this pilot that starts July 1st. Or hand me your business card, and I'll make sure you get in. So that is, that's your, I don't know, bonus for your dessert, extra dessert for coming today. Um, so hopefully that's of interest to folks in the room. Um, so really quickly, the other um, focus area that we have is on trucks. As I said, they're not big cars, they're a different group. So what we did was we did a six month pilot, 55 trucks, traveled in 20, actually should have updated this in 29 states. Look how many miles it drove, 1.4 million. So what we're finding from that, one key insight I will share with you all, which we haven't really put out there yet, is oh my gosh, the rate matters. So we use the national uh, mileage per gallon for trucks, which is about six, to have a revenue neutral rate. We had four different companies that represented those 55 vehicles. The average miles per gallon for one of those companies was 3.4 miles per gallon. Under this scenario, we would give that company back $18,000 because we wanted to be revenue neutral. So we reimbursed them for their fuel costs. And with the mileage based usage fee, they would actually pay less. Is that what we want to do? Do we want to reward a less efficient trucking company by giving them $18,000? Another company that participated was more fuel efficient than average. They would have to pay additional money in this switch from a fuel tax to a distance-based fee. So this challenge has not been raised on the passenger vehicle side because passenger vehicles don't travel as many miles. So those small differences between your average miles per gallon of your vehicle and the national average which are typically used to set rates, are not that big. So that's our, just a key insight. I'm sure Kendra will have more comments on that. But we are we're focused on making sure that the voice of the trucking industry is heard. So we have a motor carrier working group on this to meet and talk through how do we do rates, how do we do evasion, how do we really think about their interest. And also just wanna leave um, you all with this thought. I usually do a quiz and don't put the um, acronym here, but who has heard of the International Field Taxation Agreement? Kendra has, of course, on mic. All right, show offs. Um, I'd never heard of it before. So basically what this is, is an international distance-based fee for trucks. So trucks, wherever they fuel up, they record what state they fuel up. They record the miles they drive in which state. If to Inc. reallocates the funds, so where you drive is where the fuel tax gets reallocated. That sounds like a, a national distance-based fee, right? So do we need something different for trucks? I think that's an unanswered question. All right, so issues to consider, again, I'm touching on a lot of the, um, the key issues that the New York CBC report raised. We gotta do pilots. You gotta get people in the vehicle, you gotta push, push the conversation forward and they work. This concept of fair resonates with folks. People get it. You should, the more you use, the more you should pay. It's a pretty simple concept. It's like ingrained in our US DNA. 
The thing is, when you start asking people, we did a survey in Delaware and Pennsylvania, and we said, you know, do you think each driver should pay their fair share? They're like, yes. Do we think EVs should pay more because they're not paying that much right now? Everyone said yes, nodding their heads. But then we said, would it be unfair to people who buy fuel efficient vehicles to charge them more? And they're like, oh yeah, you really can't do that. <laughs> so they're saying both things. So that the bottom line is, again, people just have no clue how much they're paying. So I'm gonna go through just a few more slides here. But another key message I wanna leave with you is, no one's talking about this graph. So this graph is how much you pay in fuel plus fuel tax a month. So that little, those blue and orange bars at the top, that's a fuel tax. That's what we're talking about. 15% of your overall monthly costs. And why that's important is those EV vehicles are still paying a heck of a lot less, even if we put a small mileage based usage fee on top. We gotta start talking about the true cost of driving, which includes the fuel cost. We can't just talk about the tax, we gotta talk about fuel as well. All right, so what else I got here? The, um, Mike talked about this report, which I really wanna give West Rock credit for doing this looking at the rural urban issue with the data. Again, everyone's gut reaction is it's unfair to rural parts of our country. It's just for cities, it's awful, I hate it. So again, I confess I was a data person. We need to bring data into that conversation. So we're gonna do a similar study on the East Coast. And the last thought I'll leave you with is this importance of communicating the value of transportation. Everyone in this room, you guys came here for lunch because you care about transportation and it's beautiful here, it's a beautiful day. But for most people out there, they kind of think about transportation, but it's not that, it's not that, middle, it's not that important, it's not that critical. So there's this awareness gap between the leaders and the general public, so that leaves us in this really challenging area, which is they don't want to pay more. Bottom line, they do not want to pay. They have no, again, I said they have no idea how little they're paying now, but they just know they don't want to pay more. So what do we do? Um, who has seen the Domino's commercial where they're filling in our potholes? Right. So a pizza company's doing a better job at this than we are? So come on, we can do this. We can talk about the value of transportation when we talk about how we pay for it. So I think we really need to message, you know, using transportation funding to maintain, operate the system we have. And the public really does care about transit. There's some controversy about where we use fees and whether I applied for transit. But again, if we're trying to message what we're doing, we gotta really touch on what people care about. So those are our findings and some ideas on how to um, get through. And this is my caveat statement. The I-95 Corridor Coalition, we're not endorsing this as a solution. We don't know. I honestly wake up some days, I'm like, this is it. It's got to be it. It makes so much sense. The more you use, the more you pay. And other days I wake up, I'm like, there's absolutely no way we can do this. It's too complicated. It's too hard. So jury's out. Um, but again, we need folks like New York CBC really pushing this conversation. Everyone in their room, we got to start talking about this. And because we do have a challenge we need to face. So thank you. Um, I'd like to remind you to fill out those cards with your questions because we'll be coming around to collect those. Uh, next up, we have Kendra Hems, who's the president of the Trucking Association of New York and former national chair of the Tru Trucking Association Executive Council. Thanks, Kendra. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for the invitation to be here. And I'm not using a PowerPoint, so Bob, if you want to <laughs> join the panel again, you can. <laughs> but again, thank you so much for being here. I do think this is a very important conversation. And as Trish pointed out, the trucking industry is very different um, when it comes to funding our infrastructure and how we fund that infrastructure. And I think oftentimes, um, because we're so large and, and apparent on our highways that we're looked at as, as low-hanging fruit, and in reality, we're far more complex um, in terms of trying to bring these types of programs to the industry versus um, passenger vehicles. Uh, so with that, you know, we do understand and support the need to adequately fund our highways. The highways are our office. We're out there every single day. We are seeing and feeling the pain that's coming from the deterioration of our system. Um, the ATREATS, the American Transportation Research Institute, do, they do a cost of congestion report to the trucking industry every year. And their most uh, recent report indicates the industry loses $63 billion a year just from con uh, congestion. And probably not surprising to those in this room that go down to New York City, when they ranked counties across the nation in terms of the cost of congestion, 
um, four of the five New York City boroughs were in the top four spots in terms of the highest cost per county. On a state level, um, it's $24.8 billion per year to all motorists. Um, so that's not just segmenting the, uh, the trucking industry. And that's obviously a result from increased vehicle operating costs because of the condition of our roads, the cost of lost time and fuel and congestion, and the financial costs um, of traffic crashes. And as was stated previously, exasperating this whole issue is the fact that the state faces over a $5 billion backlog in needed repairs. So yes, we have to do something. The conversation around fuel tax um, frequently is around the fact that it's a declining source of revenue. Um, we would agree long term, that is certainly the case and we have to look at alternatives. Short term, the industry still supports an increase in fuel tax. Um, nationally, the national organization has proposed a 20 cent increase over four years. Um, and I think the numbers that Trish has are great, and I agree, so many people don't realize how little you're paying. So on the surface, 20 cents sounds like a lot um, in terms of an increase in your taxes, but it actually equates to about $100 a year um, per passenger vehicle driver um, by the time it's fully phased in in four years. So when you compare that to what we're paying, um, the trip report recently indicated to New York drivers, we're paying a little over $700 a year because of increased vehicle operating costs because of the condition of our highways. So $100 more a year in increased fuel tax, short term, to address this funding shortfall um, certainly pales in comparison to the over 700 that we're paying um, in vehicle wear and tear. But again, we recognize long term, there has to be other solutions. Vehicle mileage tax, of course, is the most popular option that is being considered. I wouldn't say that the industry is opposed to it. I think a lot of articles out there and media on this issue indicates that the trucking industry is vehemently, vehemently opposed to vehicle mileage tax. It's not necessarily the case. It's more that we're concerned. Um, there's a lot of issues that have to be worked out as have already been presented today. And I think there's a willingness to consider a VMT if it's done the right way. Um, some of our main concerns has to be easy and inexpensive to pay and to collect. Has to have a low evasion rate. We've touched on you know, the concerns about evasion. Has to be tied to highway use, which VMT is. And the biggest thing for us is it must avoid creating impediments to interstate commerce. And I will tell you, when we look at um, VMT from a state-by-state -state basis, that is a concern for the trucking industry. Um, if it's not done on a national scale for an industry that is interstate by its nature, that becomes an administrative nightmare for them to handle as they operate from state to state to state, whereas some states may have a VMT and other states may still be a fuel tax. How do they administer that internally and report all that information? Um, <clears throat> so interestingly enough, how many know, and I know we're all mainly transportation leaders in the room, but New York State still collects a highway use tax on um, commercial trucks. We're only one of four states in the country that still collect that tax. We're the only one in the Northeast. And to give you a sense of concern about VMT, um, our association has been advocating for about the last 40 years to repeal the highway use tax. Um, so clearly there's, there's some concerns about mileage-based taxes as it relates to the trucking industry. Um, but in New York, one of the biggest concerns is the evasion issue. Um, and that's obviously a concern we're going to have going forward as it relates to VMT. It puts our industry in New York at a competitive disadvantage to the states around us. The highest evaders are trucking companies that are located outside of uh, New York. So as Trish also mentioned, there's already existing mechanisms um, in place for the trucking industry to collect revenue from those out-of-state carriers. So IFTA, the International Fuel Tax Agreement, but there's also IRP, the International Registration Plan, and it works very much the same way that IFTA does, that you pay a registration fee, but that fee actually gets allocated amongst the states that you operate in. So it's again tracked by mileage. So those systems are in place, and I would <clears throat> caution as we're looking at New York specifically, I know one of the recommendations in the report was to phase this program in and to use commercial vehicles as the first step in the phase. We would say, nope, <laughs> that's a huge problem for us. It would create an administrative nightmare um, between the highway use tax 
and the um, IFTA and IRP, we're already paying our fair share. Um, and in terms of piloting this and testing it, passenger vehicles are really the best way to go. Now that said, we 100% support what I-95 is doing. Um, looking towards the future and realizing that while right now fuel tax may make sense, that going forward, even in the trucking industry, electric vehicles are something that this industry is looking very seriously at, and most of the manufacturers are now looking at um, manufacturing heavy-duty electric commercial vehicles. So it is going to be a declining source moving forward. So those pilots are critical. And I think for us, it's making sure that we're not doing something quickly, we're doing something in a measured way that makes sense, that's fair, that's equitable, and isn't going to unduly harm the industry. Um, so with that said, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Bob. I'm here really more just to kind of gauge questions and answer questions, and I've already learned a lot more about what I-95's been doing. We were aware of the study, um, but really appreciate your focus on the commercial industry and the unique challenges that we have as it relates to vehicle mileage tax. Thank you. Thank you, Kendra. Our um, final speaker is Bob Magna, who's the Senior uh, Vice Chancellor and Chief Operating Officer at SUNY. And for those of you who don't know Bob, he's the former uh, Director of the Thruway and the former Budget Director. So. Thanks. I'll sit here. You put these... <laughs> I don't have much. I want to thank the people who did the presentations. I think they were great and really enlightening for me. I would, one of my former jobs was also tax commissioner in New York, so I'll bring up two small tax policy nets that I have. I'd be careful using the word fairness, because I think this is really about costs and benefits. Yeah, you use the road more, you're imposing more cost, you get more benefit, you pay more. It's not really a fairness issue. A poor person who's driving that road is still got a harder time paying that than a rich person. So I think we need to separate tax fairness questions from cost benefit questions. But the point is still absolutely valid. The other point, and I'd love to learn more about this, to the extent that trucks pay more for this because they are imposing a bigger cost, Consumers are going to pay that because it's going to get passed on. So I think we have to be careful about how we say what the cost is of moving to a tax. These are traditional tax policy arguments, and there are answers to those questions. And that the answer may be that that extra cost imposed is something folks want to take on. But in all of these conversations, I end up to my main point, which is I go back to the most horrible job I ever had, which was as budget director of New York State. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't get to look at an issue like this in isolation, right? This is, I think, fantastic work that has to get done because it has to be presented to policymakers this way. But in New York, I, I can't speak for Colorado. I have two of my adult children living in Colorado, though, and love it. And they pay a lot less tax than they would pay if they lived in New York. Yes. A lot less. So if you look at New York and you look at person at the tax department or the division of the budget or the governor or a legislator, they can't look at this in a vacuum. They have to look at it from how are we financing state government beyond just transportation and what kind of tax burden are we imposing on our residents. So I think there are answers to all those questions and you heard a lot of it today, but I think that's where you're go the rubber is going to meet the road, in, especially in a state like New York. And that gets to the critical question of is this an add-on or is this a replacement? If it's a replacement, if I was hearing people right, it doesn't solve the problem of funding. If it's an add-on, it might solve the replacement of the funding, but then it raises all these tax policy questions about New York being a high-tax state and what do you do? And is this a priority? You know, 
I worked at the Thruway for a while. The state of New York put a lot of money into the Mario Cuomo Bridge, formerly, formerly Tappan Zee Bridge, that had nothing to do with tolls and had nothing to do with the highway use tax or the motor fuel tax. They made a conscious policy decision to invest in that roadway with state resources. And those resources came from the income tax and they came from the sales tax, again, some of the highest in the country. So you have policy questions about how you allocate your existing resources. So my only point would be all of this stuff makes, to me, perfect sense from a policy perspective. But the question is, how do you integrate it into your overall approach? Adding in 49 other states only makes it a little more complicated. I guess you can't drive to Hawaii, so that's probably okay. But I think you have those issues of how you integrate a new tax in. And again, I think the critical issue is if it's an add-on, you have very different issues because the whole distribution of who pays the tax will change a little bit than if you're doing it as a replacement of existing um, taxes. So again, I just wanted to uh, stress those points. I'd like to thank our uh, panelists, and I'm going to draw from, uh, I have my own questions, but I'm going to draw, start by drawing from the questions that um, came from the audience. And the first kind of block of question is, what is this tax for? So uh, shouldn't the fee be designed to reflect all the social cost of vehicular travel, including environmental externalities, air pollution, climate change, which are reflected in the gas tax? So broadly, what is this tax for and what kinds of things would we be substituting if we went to a, a VMT instead of a, a gas tax for things like environmental costs? That's open to the entire panel. Like, do we get to take turns? I, I'm not, I'm not going uh, <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's sitting on their hands, so I'll, I'll, I'll not stop sitting on my hands. So I, it is always um, consistent when we start talking about this switch to, from a fuel tax to a distance-based fee, people immediately go to the policy question first. So I think we're, um, it's very important, but I actually try to pull people back and say, we don't even know if the technology, if the public is even open to doing this. So I would encourage everyone to think first on just feasibility, but to get to the policy question is how you set your rates. So it is true that the fuel tax right now is a proxy for a carbon tax because it is penalizing um, more fuel and efficient vehicles. So if you go to a distance-based fee that did not vary by type of vehicle, you would lose that. There's no doubt. But I think that that's a pretty easy policy um, justification for having a different per mile rate by vehicle type. So I think that can be addressed by how you set your rates. And again, in the policy brief produced by New York CBC, they recommend variable uh, rates by vehicle type, time of day, and location. So the challenge, once you start going into different rates, that's when it gets very difficult to get it through a legislative body. So if we have not raised our federal fuel tax since 1993, do we really believe enough in our um, elected officials that they can make these tough choices on rates, time of day, location? And it just is, it's, it's a challenge. Again, that's the day that I wake up and I think, forget it, we're just gonna stay with the fuel tax. So the problem can be solved. But I think it's a tough, a tough way to, to address it. I always think we kid ourselves a little bit if we think we're solving social problems through how much we charge on fuel tax in terms of environmental issues. I get it that on the margin, it's absolutely true that it's probably reducing carbon. But I think in the... So you're balancing a policy decision about do you want to fix the road versus the environmental piece. And this is, again, always takes me to the larger issues of what's the problem you're trying to solve. If you're trying to solve financing for roads, crumbling roads and bridges, you're not also going to solve the problem necessarily of the environment. You know, you want people to drive less if you're 
worried about the environment or all in electric vehicles. So one of the challenges that, that we've been facing in California is just that. Um, so Caltrans, our client, is wanting to evaluate a sustainable revenue mechanism. You know, they're, they're looking to bridge the gap, if you will, to bring things back to a state of good repair. One of their partners for their road charge initiative is the California Air Resources Board. Their primary goal is to reduce VMT and reduce the carbon footprint uh, throughout the state of California. So it's been a challenge, um, really a policy challenge or a political challenge, getting these two entities to play nice in the same sandbox. Um, of course, it's California, and short of Texas, everything wants to be bigger in California. Um, but what we have found is those missions don't need, to need, don't need to necessarily be mutually exclusive. You know, there are ways we do expect, we hope, that VMT will decrease over time. You know, we do hope and fully intend that carbon footprint will, you know, carbon emissions will reduce. You know, there are mitigation strategies in place to reduce that. How do we do that with, while still maintaining a sustainable revenue stream? This kind of goes back to Trisha's point. You know, you got to get the rate right. Um, one of the recommendations that we learned, one of the mistakes we learned in Oregon was uh, keep the rate out of legislation. So Oregon passed legislation to set the rate at 1.5 1. 1. cents per mile. Um, it took an act of God to get that changed when we realized that we needed to change it. So um, we have since made recommendations to other states. If you're going to set a rate, set a, set a cap or set a range and put in legislation that you're going to have a committee like the Road User Fee Task Force or what have you that evaluates the rate structure and the financial impacts and marry that against all the policy considerations. So one, one other comment I want to add in. Sorry, Kendra, I think it's I just okay. cut you off. Um, so Bob, you keep coming, or this topic of what's the problem we're trying to solve keeps coming up. And I think that's a really good one. And um, one way to look at this shifting gears, which is a great um, talking point, um, is if we move to a distance-based fee, it will stop the eventual plummet of the fuel tax as a source for transportation as the fleet does change. The fleet is changing. We're going to get more EV and hybrid vehicles. How people move around is going to change. So it's getting more latched onto a longer term mechanism that would match kind of where the transportation ether is going is kind of the way to look at it. It's um, So yes, if we just replace the fuel tax with the distance based fee today, it may not solve the five, it was a billion dollar gap in needs in New York. But I think it's also, this is a, this is a big change. So this is more a long term way of how we would fund and get into people and industry's mind on making choices about vehicle type, time of day departure, where they go routing in the longer term. So I think I would look at this as long term, but we have to do actions today to, to get the path to that eventual place. Yeah, and I would just add, this is, I think, where, as an industry, we also get concerned. Our primary objective right now is to get funding for the infrastructure. Um, I think it was referenced earlier that we're in a challenge. I would say it's a crisis where we're at right now in terms of both the state and national um, lack of investment in our system is, is very much a crisis. So for us, priority number one is raising revenue to invest in our, in our transportation system. The concern is when you bring these other policy objectives into play, and, and one for us obviously is variable pricing by time of day. Um, certainly by type of vehicle, we don't have as much of a concern. We are larger vehicles. We're willing to pay our fair share. But time of day, um, type of vehicle, some of those become concerning because there's a lot of things that the industry does not have control over. Um, they're typically on the road when they're on the road because of their schedules, their need to service their um, customers. It's not because they're making a choice as to when and what time to be on that particular stretch of highway. So when we get into variable pricing by time of day, that's a big concern for us. Um, initially, as we're going through this process, and the intent is to find a new way to fund infrastructure, then that needs to be the focus. And I agree with Trish. Some of those other things can come in after the fact. But we have to keep our focus on where the need is. Can I... Uh 
Let me make one macro point, and I hate sounding like a broken record. If you think that there aren't, I work for SUNY now, I forget sometimes, right? <laughs> I, I could put five graphs up that show since 2008 SUNY's funding in real terms has plummeted. The state, um, state amount of subsidy going to SUNY has stayed flat for 10 years. In real terms, it's incredibly down. When I tell legislators, they're horrified. They don't change it <laughs> because everyone is telling them that. We have lived in state governments, New York, but I know it's not just New York, it's around the country. We have lived through a very traumatic fiscal period of time starting with 9-11 and continuing with different hits to the volatility of the revenue structure of most states. And New York has certainly not been an exception and in some ways has been in the middle of it with the financial collapse that happened in 2008. States are still adjusting to that, even now. And so I think you see it across the board, not only in highways, but in these other places. That's why I think the policy, that's why <laughs> these presentations are great, because you really have to get beyond the initial reaction you're gonna get from policymakers right now, which is, yeah, I know you got lots of problems. <laughs> and you gotta get to, no, but really this is how we need to fix it. And I think a lot of that is not getting heard right now just because people are exhausted from the fiscal fights they've had to fight over the past 20 years. And that um, happy note, we have a lot of questions about <laughs> funding and revenue and what this is actually going to cost. Um, so there's three related questions. So I'm, I'm just going to string them together. Won't we be paying more than 15% a month in gas um, tax if our taxes will also have to include paying for this new system and all the people involved in making hardware and software, reading the data, buying the port to put in our car? Um, where did the money in Colorado go if only 20 out of 100 of the EV registration fee is going to transportation funding? And then at the end of the day, what happens when we invest all of this in our roads? Do we get a return on that money in terms of we get to work faster, we have fewer costs associated with it? Like how does investing in transportation end up helping us? So worries about the cost of, of these systems, uh, where the money goes, and how do we benefit from them? All right, I dodged the, I dodged the. You're, you go first. I, I'm up now, yeah. Um, <laughs> Wow, that's a that's a that's lot. A lot. Of, yeah, uh, <laughs> so I may need some help. That's great. That's great. Um, so the cost. Uh, well, I'll I'll address the easy one first. So the the EV the EV royalty in Colorado um, is split. The hundred it's hundred dollars a year. It's a sixty forty split between um, the county and the state. Sixty percent going to the county. Forty percent going to the state. Um, of that 40% going back to the state, 50% is going to transit, and 50% is going to um, the DOT. And of that 50%, I'm, sure, I'm trying to make sure my math's right here, of that 50%, 50% of that is going to the Highway Trust Fund. So there is a $100 royalty imposed on EV owners it's just the way the policy is set up and the way the administration is set up and, and DO, DOT and DMV are under separate agencies. The money's, the money's allocated that way. All right, so that's number one. Number two, um, how do we pay for the cost or how, do we, how does the motorist burden the cost of this additional hardware? Um, there's several options. Um, one of the things that we have been exploring is, to Trisha's point, um, what are the value-added services that can be provided? So in addition to diagnostic codes, could you tie this into like a usage-based insurance? Um, do you even need to buy the hardware? Most vehicles, well, all vehicles um, have some sort of telematic system on board. Um, you know, could you leverage something like an OnStar that already collects this information, reports it back to maintain or you know, to assess, you know, uh, a mileage-based user fee. Um, 
could you you could you subscribe? Could you offset that through value added services or subscriptions? Um, the engine health, battery health, you know, those are great things. Uh, one of the other things that we've been exploring is can you use an aftermarket device to unlock your car? If you unlock your car, if you lock your keys in it, um, we actually tried that in California, and it it's it saved it saved me. Um, <laughs> we'll go there. Um, it's really nice. You know, I can even start my car remotely um, if for 10 minutes if I'm leaving the airport and have to walk across the parking lot and it's snowing and it's, you know, typical Colorado weather in December, you know, my truck will be nice and warm by the time I get there. So to Trisha's point, and we're doing the same thing in the Western states, we're exploring what, value, what other value added services could be used to help incentivize the motorist, to encourage them to participate. If they subscribe to that, you can offset some of the hardware and, and operations cost. The other way we're doing it is looking through consolidation of services. So like I said, we're talking about this mobility marketplace concept in Oregon. I think I-95 is exploring the same, a similar approach through Easy Pass, where you consolidate operations and actually get that per motorist cost down, you know, through, I, I, hate, I hate saying economies of scale, because I know Bob's going to probably tear it apart, but uh, reducing your costs through volume. <laughs> what did I miss? That was good. Yeah. That, okay. Good enough. Pretty good. That was, that was, that was great. So, um, so I had a feeling this question might come up. Um, so I did have a slide that I was going to put up to try to put some numbers to this administrative cost because you just we all kind of think, oh man, that's going to be really expensive, right? All these vehicles having to put devices in them, have account managers. This is going to be really tough. So we've actually created a financial tool. Um, it's kind of more of a back of an envelope Excel spreadsheet that, like on crack, it's awesome. But I've told you I love data, right? Okay, we're, we're, we're good with that. So we put the numbers in and basically for Delaware and said, okay, how would we create a net revenue rate? So what assumptions do we make was that um, we actually assumed it cost 2% of the fuel tax, the total fuel tax I had for administrative costs, so a little bit higher than what you guys assumed. And we would add an additional 16% on top of that. So the cost to implement a mileage-based usage fee would be 18% of the revenue collected. So that sounds like a lot, right? A 16% percentage point increase. But if you translate it into the per mile rate in Delaware, the rate went from 1.05 cents to 1.25 cents. So we're talking a fifth of a penny. So again, we gotta remember that, that the rate to cover an administrative cost may not be that bad. So that's one example when you wanted to put numbers to this. And so we're gonna keep um, adding more states into that tool to kind of run the numbers and, and see what it, would, what it would mean. So we hope people you know, really challenge those assumptions we made. Are they too high or too low? You know, Oregon going to 5% seems um, awesome. Um, I think it would take a long time for the nation to get there. So, um, but that's something to keep in mind is, you know, and this one example is a, you know, fifth of a penny. It's not, that's really not much. I mean, who picks up a penny on the ground anymore, right? And that's what we're really talking about. Pennies, pennies per mile, I think, is a great expression. And then, you know, on the value, what are you going to get from this? I think we have to do a really good job of explaining, if we make this transition, what people will get. So I think this is, you know, a concern of the trucking industry. If we do this, we have to invest this revenue back in our infrastructure. <laughs> So, and that gets tricky if you look at how a lot of states, um, how they're using, like the example of Oregon with the registration fee, right. when you get policymakers engaged in that discussion, there's a lot of things policymakers are trying to weigh. So it's, I'm not blaming and saying they're doing something wrong, it's just hard to keep it protected for transportation. But the reason why sales tax work, increases work around the country when they get on ballots, very specific delivery for what that sales tax increase will give. So I think we have to do something similar to get back to the value Trans of people will get. Transparency is key. Transparency, yeah. I mean, Which I, you guys were highlighting in your report. Just one real quick. Um, Ten years ago, um, a Western, well, I think it was Washto actually, surveyed 5,000 people around the West, Washington, Oregon, California, primarily. And... You might want to guess what their number one response was to how roads are funded, how people think roads are funded. Any guess? Adopt a mile. So the Boy Scouts, in the, a decade ago, 
The general consensus was that the Kiwanis Club and the Boy Scouts were funding road maintenance and repair <coughs> mile by mile by mile. Um, look at where we are now. So over 10 years, yeah. we've started the education campaign. We, we really, and, and this is just, this is on a small scale. You know, we threw pilots, threw demonstrations and websites and slick sheets and meeting with legislators. I mean, we're starting to get the word out. You've got to get people to understand how things are currently funded. Because most people, most people, even to this day, don't know how their roads are funded. So I think tying into that, though, having that tangible thing, there needs to be some transparency from the state. Kind of the adopt a mile concept. You know, this, this stretch of roadway was brought to you by the you know, by the New York State Mileage Based User Fee Program. Or, you know, this, uh, well, in, in Oregon, um, you know, this, these five additional bike lanes were brought to you by the Orgo program. You know, it, it's, but showing transparency, showing that this is not just another tax, you know, that this is actually going to something tangible that has direct benefit is, is gonna carry a lot of weight. So I think the two big keys here, transparency, and then the other one, which I, I neglected to mention in terms of some of the things we're looking for from alternative funding, it's the dedication, the dedicated use of those funds. Um, they have to be lockboxed. We have a situation in New York with our dedicated highway bridge and trust fund that was meant to be essentially a pay-go fund. The money comes in, the money goes out back into the infrastructure. That has not occurred, and as of today, I think it's a about 20% of the revenue actually goes back into capital projects. The rest of it is used for debt service and administrative costs. So for an industry that pays so much into this system to only have 20% of that revenue actually go back into the system, um, you know, it's, it's a big point of concern for us. So as we talk about um, if this program were to come to be, and how we use those funds, I agree 100%. The transparency of it is key. We have to be laying out exactly where that money is going and what it's being used for, and it has to be lockboxed. I have a question um, <laughs> for you guys. How do you deal with toll roads, especially in the East Coast, where you got toll roads all <clears throat> over the place, and some of them are distance, vaguely distance-based? Yeah, that one's all to you. That was all to me. Um, so I love this question, actually. So right now, do you guys pay the fuel tax when you use a toll road? So no difference is, is the easy answer. But I'm surprised that everyone's like, what? If we have a distance-based fee, you're double taxing us. Again, I guess this point, people have no idea how they're paying for transportation. So that's a coalition stance is that it's the same. You pay both because a, using a toll facility is a financing mechanism for that road, is for a higher quality of infrastructure for a more predictable time of travel. If you're not getting that from your toll road, then you should talk to your toll authority, right? But that's a whole concept, is that it is a premium service. So there would be no uh, relief or no um, taking back the mileage based usage fee, is our view at this point. Thanks. And the last set of questions we had were on participation. Um, who are the key stakeholders that have been engaged in the development of state programs and how can people get involved? Um, is there a group or committee looking for volunteers? Yes. <laughs> um, you guys, I'm, I'm, I'm actually very serious. Um, if you're interested, come join the pilot. Either go, if you look up I-95 MBUF, M-B-U-F, you'll find our website. There's a way to volunteer. Um, if you want to make sure you get in the pilot, give me your business card or give me your email and because I know someone who's running it, so I can help you get in. Um, but what we're trying to, uh, <laughs> there's cheering, did you hear that was great? Um, what we're trying to do in the East Coast is different than the West Coast because we are so much more the beginning of the conversation. Again, that's why I applaud, I keep saying it, but it's true, for what the New York CBC did is important to push this conversation forward. We're more beginning the conversation on the East Coast while on the West Coast they have a mature operating program in Oregon. So we need you to talk about this. Talk about it with your mom. It's not that classic thing or talk about your wife or husband or partner. Um, we just need to get the word out more. So target decision makers and that's what we really focused on that 155 people. This was 
you know, the head of the um, ATA. We had, you know, different thought leaders, different national organization, National Governance Association, IBTTA. I mean, you could go through the list of the acronyms of transportation organizations. So that's our approach on the East Coast to try to get large organizations engaged and you guys. So keep spreading the word. I think having New York be engaged in one of these pilots, we got two more rounds of this program, so let's take advantage of it. The coalition, we're gonna keep going after these. So whoever you know that makes decisions, um, tell them to jump on board with what we're doing, would be my recommendation. Yeah, we, so to establish the program, conduct the initial planning, um, and really make sure that there were a widely, and I use that term loosely, acceptable set of goals and objectives. We stood up technical advisory committees for every state that we've worked in. Um, these tacks range from the smallest one was uh, nine people in Colorado to 15 in California. Um, and they ranged from transportation advocacy groups, um, the Sierra Club, we actually brought in the ACLU um, which was, that was an interesting uh, series of discussions. Trucking Association um, for all the states that we've worked in, universities, academia, um, MPOs. You know, for a statewide program, you want, to, you want your MPOs to weigh in. Um, obviously, the DOT is the, uh, they're kind of the, well, they're the program manager. Um, you know, I think for, for your pilot, it was Delaware, or DelDOT was the grant recipient. Um, for California, Caltrans, for Washington State, WashDOT, you know, going, so on and so forth. Um, they really, and what we really wanted to do is we wanted to create a series of, uh, I, I'll use this term again loosely, apostles, you know, that could go out and go out like and ambassadors. Ambassadors, there you go. <laughs> I like that better than apostles. I'm going to steal it. Um, ambassadors. And, and Educate them on how this program works, what the needs are, um, what the intents are. Have them go out and be your, be your champions. But all the while, help have them also help start shaping what some of your overarching goals and objectives will be, not just for your pilot demonstrations, but for longer term implementations. Yeah, Mike, you, you did a better answer than I did. I'm sorry, I got so excited about trying to recruit you guys for the pilot. Um, so we do have a steering committee that guides this work. So we have, again, representative from ATA, IBTTA, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, National Governance Association. We have Auto Alliance, which is also a key stakeholder because they have a different point of view whether or not they should open up the computer to the driver. So their perspectives is really key. Uh, we also have the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey. Um, we have IBTTA, we have AASHTO, we have FHWA as a partner, we have you know Delaware DOT, Pennsylvania DOT, New Jersey DOT, North Carolina DOT. I'm probably forgetting somebody who will send me a note and say, why'd you forget us? Okay, there's some ahead. AAA is the other group. So um, I'm sure I did forget somebody, but I think it is important to have that range of um, stakeholders engaged in, in your conversations so and get people who don't like the idea as well as who like the idea because both sides are, are have to be part of this conversation so that steering committee has been incredibly important to help guide our work to make sure we're, we're focusing on the right things challenge us with what we're doing and also becoming our ambassadors to spread the information to their members um, and their colleagues so I just want to um Wrap, wrap things up. We're, we're coming close to the end of our time here. And just to tell, just to remind you about what we heard today, which is we have a greater need to keep up our roads than the ability to raise that and generate that revenue or have that dedicated revenue stream. Um, we also have electron, uh, electric motor vehicles. And so people who are not paying their fair share of uh, these kinds of costs, uh, especially associated with the gasoline tax. That we can all agree on. The problem is what do we do about it and how do we go about fixing it? Um, and just uh, in addition to being the director for policy and research, I'm also a professor at the University at Albany, State University of New York. Um, and it's nice when, when the things that we do in the academy actually have real world relevance. But there's a phrase that we have uh, in my field, which is all the world is Tokyo. And that means whenever we want to do something there's not a square foot in Tokyo that's not developed. Something else has to get displaced. 
And so thinking about people's connection to the gas tax and what they believe about it, it how much they believe that they're paying versus how much they're actually paying, um, and the kinds of concerns that Kendra and Bob brought up about how to get people on board with something new requires not just selling what's new, but displacing what's already there and figuring out how to dismantle it or how to repurpose it or how to remove it. And so some of the concerns we heard, privacy concerns, we heard concerns about equity. Um, and one of the questions that we didn't get to, do, to address was what is the alternative? What other options are potentially on the table? Can we have a VAT, a national you know, value added tax on motor vehicles, for example, that would build that in and get at some of the costs that we need? Um, and just to remind you, the rural issue, this is, this, you know, we're, we're studying rural Sullivan County and we went down there studying opioids and the people on the ground said, well, it's transportation, it's all transportation. They have two bus routes in a county the size of Rhode Island. One runs on Thursday and one runs on Friday. So for people in rural communities, it's not just that they might pay more, it's that they don't have any alternatives. So you make me pay more to travel, but if I live in New York City, I have the subway and all these other subsidized services. Um, so thinking about how to go about doing this, and I want to thank the CBC for kicking off this conversation um, and creating a, a report, which you should all uh, read. So to Andrew Ryan and to Patrick Orecki for um, presenting this report, and to our panelists for providing a lot of great context for what it would actually take to get these kinds of programs up and running. Kendra Hems, uh, Trish Hendren, uh, Bob Megna, and Mike Warren. Um, and a lot of these panels flew in just for this presentation, so they're not, uh, I love New Yorkers like we are, um, but they soon <laughs> will be. And thank you all for taking time out of this beautiful day to come uh, listen to this presentation.